Hi, everyone. Welcome to Indicio Identity Community event for October. We are very, very excited today. And uh, we are going to discuss about machine readable governance. We have Mike Ebert. He is enterprise software lead uh, from Indicio. And uh, we will uh, have him uh, discuss uh, all about machine readable governance. Uh, please feel free to write uh, your question on the chat or uh, hold the question at the end. Here you go, Mike. Helps if I turn mute off. Thanks, Maya, and uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let's get started right away. Okay, so. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention all the help and assistance I got from uh, Simon Nazarenka from my team. And uh, he's, uh, he's done a lot of the heavy lifting on the code side uh, we, and we talked theory and stuff together. So we'll get, make sure he's got credit there. So um, kind of an initial comment is uh, this is very much a work in progress. Uh, we were driven by the need to have something that we could implement right away without uh, waiting too long for big, grand, overarching uh, systems and agreements in the industry. So this is something that can be stood up uh, one small ecosystem or use case at a time. Uh, and it kind of started with a question, aren't protocols good enough for managing uh, an ecosystem? And uh, protocols allow people to agree on how to perform a single action, but they don't necessarily contain enough information about the context of what's going on, uh, who you should trust, or what steps are in uh, a grander or larger workflow. Uh, we also did uh, a lot of work starting with what Daniel Hardman has said. Uh, he's uh, well known and respected in the identity community. And so he, he wrote uh, a concept RFC about machine readable governance. And so we have a couple quotes from him here. A governance framework, also called a trust framework, is a set of rules that establish trust about processes and indirectly about outcomes in a given context. So uh, it's kind of like playing a game. If, you know, if nobody knows the rules to baseball, then you don't know which direction to run the bases. You don't know whether someone's out or not. You can't even keep score. And so if you can establish some rules and some trust, you know, who are the umpires, who are the, uh, you know, the team uh, captains, et cetera, then, then things go more smoothly. Uh, specifically, machine readable governance, um, governance frameworks em embodied in formal data structures, so it's possible to react to them with software, not just with human intelligence. So one of the things that we see in the industry right now is there are uh, you know, a, a good number of generic issuers and generic uh, wallets. And, uh, you know, they all do some of the basic operations, but it would be really cool if our software tools could help people understand what to do uh, and smooth things out so that you don't have to push the I accept or uh, type in a URL or know exactly what to do next um, without any assistance from a machine. So uh, our goals for machine readable governance for our first couple passes were to provide some information about roots of trust, uh, to organize the ecosystem by codifying some of the rules and standards. Uh, we, we were able to decouple some of the business logic from our code so that we could you know, change the rules that are in play without having to uh, republish or reissue our agents. And uh, this gives us some flexibility for uh, accommodating change and as things you know, are updated in the future. Uh, so for example, um, we were building an ecosystem for a verifiable credential trial. Uh, it's public knowledge of, of the trial that we did in Aruba. And so it was a travel use case and uh, we needed to stand up the issuers, the holders and the verifiers. And uh, we wanted our our issuers and our verifiers to know a little bit about which, which issuers to trust and things like that. So uh, the, the needs of an ecosystem can be broadly uh, grouped into assets, 
So kind of nouns, the things that are in the ecosystem, uh, the actions, the things that you can do, and the authorizations, who's allowed to do what. And uh, we started off with a couple key components. So the glue that holds everything together is the governance file. And then uh, verifiable credentials rely on schemas. And uh, we have presentation definitions that define uh, what kind of data is acceptable in a credential uh, when you go to get verified. And then uh, interaction documents define uh, a workflow, the process of going through things. So we already talked about that one. Uh, a governance file allows a jurisdiction to act with some sovereignty. So to say, we are in charge of, you know, the Aruba government is in charge of who's allowed into the country. And uh, here are the rules that we are specifying that people need to follow. Uh, governance files are also useful because uh, they can be hand edited or generated and you can cache them to improve uh, offline operations or to reduce network traffic. Let's see. So we've written some code that uh, responds to governance when it's there and functions when it's not there. And it's uh, an opt-in situation. So agents can utilize the governance. They're not 100% bound to it. Um, but you know, buyer beware if you interact with agents that are not uh, listed as, as trusted. So uh, a governance file has some metadata. We can review the specifics of the metadata later. But the idea here is to provide information about the governance structure, uh, the related documents, um, which version number it is, uh, jurisdictions and geographies. And we have some to do's here. Uh, it would be good for a governance file to say which network or ledger are we using? Uh, is there a mediator available for mobile agents? And then uh, I need to provide a link that says who do you talk to if somebody in the ecosystem is misbehaving? Uh, I can pause there for questions. Does anybody have a question so far on uh, governance files or their metadata? Uh, Mike, tell me if I'm asking too deep of a question at this at this pass. But um, with a mediator, isn't that usually supplied by the holder of a of a a mobile app, right? The person who has the mobile app, either the mobile app themselves or the user has coordinated a mediator. I'm I'm curious about the role of that in in a governance file here. Um, can I jump in on this, Mike? Yeah, go ahead, James. What? So one of my thoughts here, Sam, is that. I, I, I would say that this shouldn't discourage the use of your own mediator. However, uh, it could be beneficial if uh, there are mediators that are able to be used within an ecosystem. That could be something that could help uh, additional parties to use that ecosystem. So if you have an app that is particularly, um, its primary purpose is to interact within the context of a governance framework, uh, that could be something beneficial potentially. Interesting. James. It could also, I'm, I'm realizing too, that it could also be used in a more generic way, meaning not, hey, here's this governance and you have to use my mediator. But one of the functions of a governance file could be, hey, here's some mediators that are available. And that uh, is a way to sort of bootstrap, uh, particularly um, uh, open source projects that don't necessarily come baked in or provided with their own mediator to make that happen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a lot of this governance is meant to be opt-in, use what's useful and helpful to you. And so a mediator, information about a, a mediator that you could use uh, is optional, uh, but could be really useful. So yeah, very good comments, James and Sam. Mike, uh, I had another question. So mm -hmm. who publishes the governance file? Is it forced to be in a registry? Can it be standalone? How, how do you, how do you, how does that accomplished? So uh, we definitely have a conversation about uh, publishing and trust registries and things like that. Uh, later on in the presentation, but uh, to answer that question right now, uh, this, this particular proof of concept, the governance file was published by uh, the nation of Aruba. It provided a server where we could host the file and we published it there. And then we took the URL and coded it into the agents that would be involved. And so uh, whoever stands up the ecosystem, whoever has the legal uh, jurisdiction to dictate what happens there, 
can stand up their own and publish it how they see fit. Uh, we're looking at ways to make that more secure so that you can trust the source of the governance file itself. Um, you could work with a broader ecosystem. Uh, so for example, uh, there's some talk of having various trust registries where uh, an organization goes to the trouble of vetting uh, various participants in an ecosystem and perhaps issuing credentials to that effect. And you could coordinate with a trust registry to uh, copy the information or even generate the governance file from what's in a trust registry. So there, there are various options there. And uh, but a trust registry is not required. It's not required. Uh, nothing more is required. It, uh, you, you can even publish the governance file on the same server as one of your issuers. So in the, the Aruba case, they had an issuer for the government that issued the credential that allowed you to travel. And on that same issuer agent, they provided the governance file that says, uh, here are the trusted medical issuers, and here are some uh, verifiers that we've vetted. So you can go anywhere from do it yourself, hand coded, all the way up to governing body automatically generated and anywhere in between. Thank you. Uh, James has a comment. He says, perhaps we could post governance files to a ledger and that's a good possibility to explore. We'll look into that. Uh, the discussion about schemas is uh, really quick. Everybody should be familiar with a schema. It basically says here are the attributes that go into a particular uh, credential and uh, our governance file does uh, basically just lists them. It says here are the schemas that we're using in this ecosystem and provides a friendly name. Um, okay, so participants, uh, it is sometimes helpful for a governance file to say, who are we expecting to participate here? Who has gone to the trouble of jumping through the hoops or certifying or signing a contract or whatever the process is to say, we're gonna behave well and follow the rules of this governance framework. And uh, if a trusted participant misbehaves, um, you can actually describe uh, recourse in some linked documents. Uh, so the li list of participants basically has a name, uh, the did, and some other information that could be useful for agents to display. Uh, governance uh, frameworks or ecosystems have roles. They have uh, particular actors who are supposed to behave in a particular way. Uh, so you may have issuers, you may have verifiers, you may have agents that act as some combination of both. Uh, there's some, some use cases where you may even want to uh, list the, the holders, who's allowed to hold credentials in your ecosystem. Most of the time that part's not necessary, but you can do that. And you can combine multiple roles per agent. Um, in this case, it was a medical and travel use case. So we have health, travel, uh, verifiers and issuers and a hospitality verifier. Finally, once you have roles and participants, you can give out permissions. You can say this participant is able to do this action um, because they have this role. Um, I think it's just the file. Yeah, we'll look at this complicated code later. Uh, the actions are descriptions of what can happen in the system, such as connect, issue a lab order credential, issue a lab result, uh, issue a vaccine credential, uh, further down, verify a vaccine exemption, verify a trusted traveler. So these name the actions and uh, some details about how that action is to take place. And then we get to the glue of our initial pass of uh, a governance file, which is the privileges. And this says uh, which roles are allowed to do which actions. And it just specifies, you know, it's. So we have a mapping to say who's allowed to do what. Um, presentation definitions are also large files. They're separate from governance files and usually you link to them from the governance file and they allow you to specify requirements to say, uh, so for example, if Aruba is going to allow someone to travel into the country, they say you must have a PCR test uh, that's negative 
in the last three days. If you meet that requirement, you can come into the country. And if you don't, then we're sorry, you can't. Uh, they've since added vaccines to that list. But um, if you have a PCR test that's too old, then you may have a valid credential, a verified credential where the cryptography passes and the issuer is recognized, but the values that are in it don't pass muster. And a presentation definition allows you to specify all of the different ways that someone can meet your, your verification requirements. Um, and they're, they're really big and too deep for today. I think I skipped a slide. Let's see here. Okay. Um, so we already talked about presenting proof. We already talked about validating documents. Uh, we have a brief demo from Simon. Uh, he's going to show us a little bit about how, based on the list of participants, the roles that are in the system, uh, which participants have which roles, and which roles are allowed to do which actions, uh, some code that you know generates a, a visible result based on the governance. And um, so basically, he'll show us how uh, things work properly with the governance in place and how uh, an agent would say uh, you're not able to do this because you don't have the proper roles given to you. So uh, Simon, go ahead and boot up your demo, please. Hello, and uh, we'll start. So, um, <clears throat> um, when the government, uh, let's say of Aruba, uh, decides that they would like to participate in our ecosystem, they would need to go and anchor the DID. Um, and I started with the government because I'm going to show you my demo on the government side, not on the uh, lab side. So. Uh, the agent administrator would need to anchor the DID using uh, one of the endorsers. And once this is public and uh, on the ledger, um, they will turn into they will turn to uh, the uh, governance administrator and they will say, hey, uh, we would like to participate in uh, your ecosystem and use your governance. So uh, they would need to bring the information uh, about the, uh, themselves as the, you know, some information about them being participants, including the name and some websites and email. But the most interesting part, uh, most important part is the did they, that uh, they just entered. And uh, with that did, uh, which needs to be included into the participants list, uh, the, uh, the uh, governance administrator would also need to add it uh, to the permissions, uh, which should be granted based on uh, the did. Um, sorry, the actions that need to be granted based on the did. So once this is granted, uh, um, our code in the agent would be able to uh, check if the did is public and anchored. And once it's anchored, uh, we should be able to go and look up for the privileges that um, this agent is granted based on uh, this anchor did. And in our case, we would be granted uh, uh, <clears throat> the privilege to uh, verify the identity and uh, issue, issue trusted traveler right here. So how is it being used? Um, on the front end here, if I refresh my page, you can see that there is a button to add a contact and this calls the uh, ACAPI agent and it sends back the URL. So this is tied to the privilege right here. So we can, we actually check uh, on the array of privileges. And if we can find the verify identity privilege, we allow this call to be made. Uh, the same happens uh, for the uh, actual uh, issuing trusted traveler. This button right here is uh, tied to the privilege of issuing trusted traveler, and it will work only in this specific case. So uh, just to give you a quick demo, if I go to the governance framework file and I 
uh, grab all of this and remove and I refresh the page, uh, it will complain about uh, missing permissions, uh, it, missing the governance itself. If I try to click the button, it will tell us that we don't have enough privileges. So this allows some flexibility and, and uh, extra security for uh, performing some operations. But again, this is optional to implement. Uh, only if the agent would like to follow the governance, uh, we would need this. But uh, for the sake of uh, <clears throat> uh showing you uh we demo this example so um in uh, the governance file we also will reference uh presentation exchange file and uh, right now it's being hosted on my local machine here so to be able to issue trusted traveler we would refer to the per, uh, partic uh the presentation exchange and this file specifies that we would need to pick one of the options from the group of input descriptors. And we have just three of those, uh, one for a vaccine exemption, another one for the vaccine itself, and the third one is for uh, lab result. So you can see that my holder already was issued the vaccine vaccination record and exemption record. And uh, we are able to generate uh, <clears throat> as many messages as we need to ask for the proof from the holder to satisfy the submission requirement. So I can uh, connect to my agent and we'll create the secure connection here and I will pass, pass my demographics and passport. So this information is here and uh, by clicking this button right here, we will generate um, actually four proof request messages that will go and it will um, um, go through the ACAPI to the holder and it will pass some cryptographics and uh, predicates test and uh, once we get the results uh, we should also go through some validation uh, on the credential on the proof uh, sorry on the proof and uh, on some values and we should be able to issue credentials uh, as many credentials as we satisfy uh, the requirements based on the presentation exchange uh, file. So uh, you can see in my log that <clears throat> it's being processed right now and calls are being made and validation is uh, happening. So because we're using uh, present proof uh, version 1.0, we can actually generate multiple messages and we send multiple messages but the holder cannot uh, handle them all uh, uh, properly right now so th that's why you saw an error message there but eventually you say happy traveler and this results in issuing uh, multiple trusted travelers which is again not an intended it is an intended behavior for uh, using the older version of the proof present proof uh, we are planning on switching to present proof uh, version 2.1, which allows us to uh, send one message with multiple proof requests in it, and the holder will be able to handle that and allow the user to choose from, um, from the uh, credentials that it's already been issued uh, to, um, uh, to allow to use the one that uh, we really want. So uh, eventually we would uh, issue only one trusted traveler based on the uh, option that the holder will choose from the list of the issued credentials. And that was my demo. So this is a, a neat demo because it shows the issuers and the verifiers and the holders all responding to rules that are in a governance file rather than hard-coded in the agents. And so if Aruba were to change their requirements to say, uh, uh, we need to add another vaccine, you know, not just the Moderna or the Pfizer or the Johnson & Johnson, there's a new one that we have to add, or uh, we no longer accept PCR tests, or we're going to add uh, antigen tests, or we require a PCR test and a vaccine. They could make those changes in their rules in the governance file and the presentation definition without having to uh, force all of their mobile agent uh, wallets to be updated on people's devices. 
Thanks, Simon. We'll go back to the slide deck here real quick. OK. So uh, we'll briefly go over some things that are exciting about the future. Uh, we mentioned interaction documents uh, as a way to specify the major steps in a workflow, um, including error cases. Uh, so this is based on a presentation given by Keith Smith at the ARIES Working Group. And the basic idea here is you have a section called flows that would have various steps in it and say things like the first step is to connect to the health issuer. And if you're successful, the next step is to have your identity verified. When your identity is verified, the next step would be to go get your health credential. After you have your health credential, connect to a travel issuer. When you connect to the travel issuer, verify your identity again. Once you've verified your identity, then you would go to issue a travel credential. And then once you have your travel credential, um, you just issue that and you're done. That's the last step. But you can string together uh, actions that are, you know, each action could be based on a particular protocol. You can string them together to guide a, a new user or a participant in the ecosystem from zero to actively participating and happy um, with the guidance of their device and their, their agents. Um, this is a, a software implementation detail about things you could do within an agent. Uh, you could have your uh, different parts of the code uh, send notices or events that you completed a particular action to other parts of the code so that you could, for example, display notices or unlock menus or uh, you know, various options like that based on uh, actions that happen in the workflow. Uh, an interesting topic that we briefly touched on before was uh, where does governance come from and how is it published? And uh, a possibility for the future is composability. You could, for example, it, you know, to go back to the Aruba example, uh, Aruba's sister islands, Bonaire and Curaçao, I hope I pronounced that right, um, could say, you know what, we really like what Aruba has done with their governance and we would like to copy it. So we're going to publish a governance file and we're going to specify or inherit from the Aruba governance file everything that's in there and then we'll override the parts that we want to change. So for example, they might change just the participants section. Um, another option would be you could write your own governance from the ground up and say, we're going to borrow parts, only parts of someone else's governance file. So Kurosawa could say, we have our own list of participants and our own list of, uh, you know, our own list of uh, actions, but we're going to use the same list of schemas or uh, the same workflow. So you could inherit all or part of someone else's governance file and reference those. Uh, another question that comes up when you talk about the publication and sharing of governance files is discoverability. So how would you discover what the governance is for uh, the various jurisdictions? If you, if you travel from you know, the United States to Aruba, how does your device know to use the Aruba uh, governance file? Or um, if you go to a place where uh, multiple jurisdictions could apply, you could, you know, how would you select which one to that you wanted to, to participate in? For example, uh, maybe various social networks. You have an application that could support chat and video and file sharing, and you want to know should I use Facebooks or Googles? Um, you could provide directories of governance files. Uh, there could be a ratings system that says this one works well or is trustworthy. There's some just, you know, exciting possibilities there. Uh, we briefly touched on trust registries and machine readable governance. Um, they kind of address slightly different needs. Uh, the machine readable governance that we've published so far has a lot to do with the a local ecosystem, uh, who's allowed to do what and what the actions and workflows are, the standards of verification. Uh, the trust registry is a lot about um, how do you verify that a particular participant is trustworthy? How, how can you certify that they are 
the proper governing authority or they're allowed to issue or they're a verifier who will treat your data well. And uh, you know, you could have trust registries and machine readable governance live completely, you know, they could be completely separate or they could work together. Um, all right, uh, I will share the link to this slide deck and there's a full example governance file at the end and a full sample presentation definition at the end. Um, so you can go dig through the code in its full context and all its nitty gritty detail and uh, see what's going on there. Um, and then finally, uh, you, our contact information is here in case you have questions uh, about machine readable governance. And we can do that now, we can uh, take questions or have a discussion trying to decide things. Please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, speak out. Can we imagine using it to authorize wallets in which we can issue, in which we can issue a credential? Um, so since we're trying to keep supporting the decentralized nature of uh, self-sovereign identity and verifiable credentials and uh, support ad hoc or you know, built as you go kind of relationships, and to be an uh, open community that allows the participation of uh, many, many parties and supports things like new wallets that you didn't know about. Uh, I don't know, uh, a lot of the cases here, you usually wouldn't strictly lock things down, but you could, uh, for example, maybe in the metadata, um, make a list of recommended agents, ones that have been uh, tested and proven to work. Um, there are some cases where if you have a closed ecosystem within a company or uh, very strict regulations uh, monitored or, or controlled by government, uh, let's say you were managing uh, nuclear, nuclear reactors and uh, it's managed under you know, a government watch body and you have to make sure that everything is very vetted. You could use a, a governance file to say, um, if you're not one of these approved holder agents um, or one of these, these three issuers and two verifiers, then uh, the system, the ecosystem will reject you completely. Whereas in other use cases like travel, it might be saying the, here are the recommended ones. And as long as you follow the rules, we'll let you participate even if you're not on the list of recommended uh, agents. So there is a spectrum from totally locked down to completely open. Um, that would be supported uh, as far as uh, listing which wallets or agents are supported. That's a good question, Felipe. Thank you. Mike, does the, uh, the machine readable governance work um, only on the agents that we've um, put together the demonstration for, or how is it adapted to other agents that might be in the, out there that are not, for instance, based on Akapai? So uh, the work we put into the governance file was based on um, the RFC that Daniel Hardman published several years ago. So. Uh, hopefully it's not entirely new to the community. Uh, the work here is being published and also open sourced. So uh, as soon as we can get our, uh, you know, fitted into our schedules, we'll be uh, releasing the bulk of this code into the Cardia ecosystem, for example, which is open source. Uh, we'll be publishing an RFC so that the community can follow the same directions and uh, ideas. Um, uh, as far as, and, and that's in regards to, uh, in particular, issuers and verifiers, uh, most generic holders 
um, you know, won't be barred from participating, um, but could also, you know, uh, James from, you know, helps run the Bifold project and they have plans to be able to respond to governance files uh, in their agents. Um, so uh, at the moment, there, there's a fairly limited number that support governance files, uh, but that number should go up as it's all shared publicly and as, you know, the benefits kind of become known. Um, and uh, we'll try and be compatible with the agents that don't understand it yet. Does that answer your question adequately? Yes, it does. And uh, have you have you yet um, published an, an interop profile that says here are the protocols that were used in order to make this work? Or is there a minimum set of protocols that are, are kind of required to make it work? Or is it is that pretty more flexible than than rigid? Um, right now it's, uh, we haven't actually tested a ton of different, let me find the, um, the bit here about actions. Uh, we've not tested across tons and tons of different protocols. Uh, this list of actions that are in the governance file, um, this sample selection here, uh, specify, it helps, you know, agree on a protocol it says, this is what the agent is expecting or is going to use. So like, for example, um, when the government agent is going to issue a trusted traveler, uh, the receiving agent should know that our implementation right now is gonna be using the issue credential 1.0 protocol. Um, uh, we could- so in, a sense, in a sense, the uh, governance file is itself the interop profile. Because yeah, it, the governance file itself can be used as the interop profile, yeah. Because it describes the different protocols that will be used for different steps along the process. And the schemas that will be in play, yeah. Uh, and uh, we did a, an interopathon, uh, basically an interop testing event with Cardia uh, pre-governance. It was based on uh, verbally agreed on workflows that were hard coded into all the various participating agents. Um, I think in probably late January is when it's slated right now, we'll be doing another interopathon. And one of the things there would be uh, to have agents that uh, utilize at least some of the, the governance file to help guide their interactions. So we'll, we'll begin using governance files as part of the interop profiles. Hey, Mike, could you discuss how this could be used to get people to use their turn signals? <laughs> no, I, I kid, I kid. The, the, the question I have is this appears to answer the why should I trust an issuer problem? If I could boil the richness of what you've described down to maybe a key, a, a key problem that the community actually has. Um, are there other methods to solve that particular problem? Or, or, or is, I mean, this is the only thing that I think exists in the community that I've seen that addresses this problem directly in, 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 in an open way. Um, are there other options that we've got or is this, is this the only thing out there really? Uh, as far as I'm aware, this is the first one to hit, uh, you know, a, a real trial, you know, a larger scale trial or a, um, you know, or considered production. We have a slightly simpler version of this uh, that's gone into production for a different client. Um, I think it's kind of the same problem that trust registries are trying to solve. Uh, the problem with trust registries sometimes is that uh, since they're moving at kind of a uh, industry-wide or global or uh, governmental level, uh, you know, they're, they're a lot slower moving and, um, uh, you know, it's kind of top down and centralized. And so uh, doesn't, doesn't completely answer the question yet. Um, one thing that we could add to this section of, of participants that are trusted by a particular ecosystem or jurisdiction is uh, an option to uh, require uh, the presentation of a credential that's issued by some uh, trustworthy or governing body or authority. And that's a lot of what a trust registry would have in it is, is some credentials that go with it. But yeah, it's, it's, 
as far as I'm aware, it's either this or the trust registries and the trust registries aren't ready to go yet. I think this is um, where the rubber meets the road right now. Does anyone else know of a, a, an alternative for providing, you know, trust about the issuers or verifiers? I think the other method that's in common use today is hard coding it into the apps, which yeah. is kind of a, um, it works, but it's not the most flexible organization I've ever seen. Yeah, it works. Uh, but part of the trouble there is that uh, makes it hard to add new ones. And uh, there's some information there that's uh, not necessarily discoverable. Um, so like, for example, um, you know, uh, if you wanted to see the list of uh, verifiers, I, you know, I don't know how many agents have that coded in there to say, uh, you know, here are the, the people that we're working with to make this ecosystem work. Uh, let's see, another part that we kind of glossed over was the richness of the presentation definition. Um, so the presentation definitions are, uh, they're so big. Um, so you can say, you know, just like a, a governance file, there's some metadata and an ID to uniquely identify this one. And then you can start a list of submission requirements. Uh, it can be a whole array of multiple requirements, or in this use case, it was a single requirement that had several options. So you could pick one from the set of health proof options. And then the file allows you to uh, say, here's the first batch, the first batch of requirements, the first option, um, or I guess in this case, it's the third one. And this is the, the verification where we ask for a lab result. And uh, it says which schema they're going to use. And, um, and then it has a list of constraints with the fields and says, here's the name of the field and uh, what type of file or what type of field it is. Um, and uh, in order to support some of the options, like in this case, a lab result that's negative or a lab result that's positive, we actually had to come up with a nested structure. And uh, you can say uh, there's a Unix timestamp based date. So you could say compared to today, the uh, lab specimen collected date needs to be uh, no more than uh, three days old. And this is in seconds. Um, or if it's a positive test, it has to be more than two weeks, uh, two weeks old, or no, four weeks old, um, so that you could say, yes, someone had COVID and they've since recovered and are definitely healthy and not contagious now. Um, and so these great big files allow you, you know, uh, you could say the uh, vaccine, uh, no, you know, the vaccine name needs to be one of Moderna, Pfizer, and let's say they don't support Johnson & Johnson. So if you get a Johnson & Johnson vaccine presented, then, then that's a no-go. Um, so there's, there's a little more detail on the presentation definitions, um, specifying, you know, defining what a presentation needs to look like. Let's see, anything else that's interesting to go over? So as a, as a community, um, maybe discoverability is a good thing to chat about. What seems like uh, the best mechanism for making governance uh, discoverable, to be able to find out what governance there is or what you're supposed to use. Um, I have two ideas here. You could have a uh, directory, uh, you could have ratings. Um, are there any other mechanisms that might be useful here? Uh, 
think it might be possible to discover from other others that you're interacting with. Um, either because they say, hey, let's engage on protocol X with governance framework Y. And you're like, oh, I haven't heard of that one. That could be a way. Um, uh, or uh, there's the feature discovery protocol and, and uh, governance uh, files could, I think, be shared sort of that way to say, hey, here's the, the governance frameworks I'm prepared to interact under. And of course, you could discover ones that you're unaware of. Awesome. I'm going to add those right now. I'll just go right into edit mode. And let's go add those ideas. I like them both. Let's see, too far. Right, almost there, here we are. All right, so those were, uh, let's see, there's the feature discovery protocol, right? Yeah, feature discovery. I don't really have a way in other protocols to say this is the governance framework that I'm trying to be a part of right now, but I can imagine that in the future. So the only really immediately practical one would be feature discovery, I think. Yeah, so you could say, uh, you know, you go to interact with a particular agent and upon first connection, the agent could tell you Hey, uh, just so you know, we're using this governance uh, governance framework uh, in case you want to want to follow that and you know figure things out based on that. So yeah, cool. Uh, um, so yeah, one one interesting thing about this is there's there's so much that could be done that. Um, we're basically coding as, as fast as our little fingers can fly in an attempt to uh, you know, provide a good example for what can be done, try to get our arms around it, try and get ahead of uh, you know, potentially other decisions or, or methods that may or may not be uh, as wonderful. We, you know, we're very open to discussions on all of it because um, you know, as, as this becomes the, you know, Kind of the next phase of the the whole ecosystem and industry. You know, we have a number of agents that can do issuing and holding and verification, and now describing how they should interact with each other and be interoperable is really important. So we're we're doing our best to get our arms around it as, as quickly as we can. So uh, if you have questions, concerns, requests, ideas, um, you know, we'd love to hear them so we can uh, try and uh, do the best thing possible going forward. Does anyone have any questions about uh, any of the particular code? Let's see, anything interesting here? Uh, I think we did a pretty good job today. Thank you, Mike. Um, if anybody, last question. Uh, do you have anything? If not, uh, I would like to uh, let you know about our next month's meetup. Uh, it's gonna be November and uh, there's a Thanksgiving. So we are accommodating the date. Next meetup is going to be uh, November 30th, uh, at the same time, 12 Eastern time. And our topic is going to be trusted digital ecosystem for inclusion. Um, so uh, we will discuss uh, about financial inclusion with some speakers. We are still in the process of finalizing speakers. It will be final, uh, fireside chat conversation. And uh, we are always looking for the topics and any suggestion, please email me at uh, maya at indicio.tech. 
Um, uh, we are always welcome to hear from you. Um, also, if you have any question, comment, please always uh, reach out to us. Um, thank you, Mike, again today. And uh, we look forward to uh, meeting everyone on November 30th. Thank you. Thanks, Maya. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.